what can new adjusters do to set themselves apart and be given an opportunity? I'm, I'm curious um, what you think you should do and maybe what you've heard other people say that you should do maybe on social media. Well, you know, I mean, I've heard people, of course, say, you know, get the exact amount, get the stability. You know, you want to be well-rounded. You know, go to a go to an adjuster school. You know, so I know you've had some type of formal training. Try to get the designations, like the state form designation, the USAA certification. You know, but from my personal experience, I found that even though you do all those things and, and you do what everybody recommends and tells you. You know, there's also 50 other people that are doing the same thing as you. So how do you separate yourself from the 50 other people that are in the exact same position as you? You know, what what makes them say, hey, we're going to let her have a chance. We're going to give her an opportunity. You know, how do you set yourself apart? Sure, sure. That's a great question. And you answered a lot of it. Um, and what you just said, just out of curiosity, are you interested in doing like desk work or are you, do you have any aspirations to go work in the field at all? Well, if I had a preference, I would prefer desk work, but I am not against the field. I am not against, you know, cat, um, okay. open to any opportunity. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. And that's, that's a really, really good start. And that's, that's. A big part of my answer to this question is that, right, is to make yourself available, especially in the beginning, for as much as possible. Because you, if a person, and there's a few pieces to this, but the, the first one I will say is that if a person postures themselves as not wanting to come in and serve the industry, which it sounds like you are, um, then you're going to be willing to do or a person will be willing to do whatever they need to do to help out the I firm to, to service their client. Right. So if they say, Hey, you know, we don't really have much desk work right now, but man, I sure could use somebody in uh, Baton Rouge or, you know, in Houston or whatever. Uh, we've got some claims over there. And uh, I think these would be, you know, you're new. Uh, we totally know that you're new, uh, but I think that you could probably handle these and we'll help you out. We'll get, we'll start you off with three and, and we'll see how they, they do, right? Or we have a, a cat somewhere and we need, we need we're desperate for adjusters. Um, one of the things, you know, that I'll say about this is that, and this, this, has, this has been a thing that's happened before all the remote desk work stuff kind of popped up. And that is when there's a big hurricane, um, it represents a big, those big hurricanes and like major catastrophes represent, um, opportunities for adjusters to to generate a lot of income in a short period of time, right? So it's really, really, really attractive to people to say, "Man, I'm you know I, I can go on that, that hurricane and I might be able to pay off my house right in like four months, kind of a thing." Um, so what happens is is that normally when there's absent any kind of a big storm, there are claims happening all the time. Right there's house fires, there's vandalism, there's all those things. Right, um, water damage is a big one. There's every second of every day, some somebody's having a water loss somewhere in the United States. Right, so those claims have to be handled, and the carriers still use a lot of carriers still use independent adjusters for daily claims. You know, sometimes a um, an adjuster will quit. They have they have a territory like they've got the whole eastern half of Washington state or something like that. And they decide they don't want to be an adjuster anymore. They, they get a better offer somewhere else. So they quit. Now that territory is open um, and nobody's there to handle claims. So the carrier will immediately backfill with an adjuster or two or three adjusters or try to slide people around. Right. So they're kind of, the claims aren't going to stop coming in if they lose an adjuster in an area. So those are always opportunities for adjusters to work. Right. West coast, um, New York, States like that, we don't traditionally have like a lot. It's not like Dallas where every third person is an independent adjuster, it seems like. And, and most of the rest of the country, it's very few people even know that we exist. Um, so what happens is, is when a, a big hurricane hits, a lot of adjusters who are doing daily work will jump up 
and go run through the hurricane, right? Well, that still leaves those claims behind, right? So those are opportunities, and I'm getting to a point here on this. Those are opportunities for people that don't want to necessarily go do hurricane stuff to say, hey, I'm, I'm staying. I'm not going on the hurricane. Load me up, right? That's how somebody serves the industry by saying, I don't care where the claim is. I'm here to help you with it. I'm not just going to go be a mercenary and run and go and try and do like tornado or uh, hurricane claims or whatever. Um, so that person is now distinguishing themselves, right? Um, as a beginner, it's basically the same kind of thing, right? So, and it may be that that person that, that, that uh, said no to the hurricane wants to go on the hurricane, but they know that if they do, it's going to leave their eye from the carrier at a lurch at home because the water's claims and the fires aren't going to stop happening. Right. So for a new person, you may not be getting opportunities to do daily claims right out of the gate because they are more complex. Um, sometimes you can certainly, but usually no. Um, but if you, if you, Position yourself and just say, hey, listen, when you talk to these IA firms, you're like, you know, I just picked up my uh, my Oklahoma license and I wanted to see if anything was going on. Right. When you, whenever you whenever I get a new license, you know, as an adjuster, especially when you're brand new, I'm calling in. Right. Even if it's going to update automatically in the system, I'm still going to call and I'm going to talk to somebody, get them on the phone. Because most people don't do that these days. That's one big thing that you can do to distinguish yourself is to pick up the phone call in and, and you're offering value, right? You're saying, hey, listen, I just opened up a new um, place for me for me to work to serve you in Oklahoma, right? Or maybe you picked up three other licenses. You got Minnesota, it's, you know, whatever. And, oh, and by the way, I'm, you know, you guys know that I really want to do remote desk work, um, but I'm, I, if you have a need to go, um, if you need adjusters or an adjuster in Oklahoma or another state that I'm licensed licensed in or any other state, I'm happy to like pack my bag and jump in the truck and go. Right. And that's, that's not something that everybody does. Right. Most people, when they call in, they want to um, see if there's work, right. Which you are, you're trying to see if there's work, but you're saying I will take whatever you have versus I only want to have like the specific thing. A lot of times they're calling in if they call in to, um, Ask what the pay is, right? What's the cut, right? You're not as a new person. You're not going to do that because your main concern as a new person is to get on the get points on the board, right? So that that means doing something in claims, because if you know the the key thing for all for all this is to build relationships, right? And you do that by offering value, and the value that you bring is is to go wherever they need you, whenever they need you, for however long. If it's one day. It's a three-hour one-way, you know, drive to this place, to the insurance house, and it's a terrible claim, or it's a, it's no damage, or denial, or whatever it is, right? You just take it with a smile, right? They want to work with people that they want to work with, right? Meaning that they want to work with people that they like, that are adaptable, that aren't going to complain and, and cause them grief every time they call. Just you know, making a big deal about mileage and all that kind of stuff on these on claims like that doesn't matter what it pays to start. You're just trying to build relationships, right? The second thing that you could do to distinguish yourself is to get as absolutely as many licenses as possible. And that's going to help. I believe it helps a desk adjuster more than it even helps a field adjuster because if they say, Hey, listen, we got, you know, remote work. We've got, we're doing, we have some uh, photo and scope guys up in New Hampshire and you have a New Hampshire license and you can, you know, you've got an Xactimate level two, then you can write those claims, right? If you live in Louisiana, if you don't have a New Hampshire license, you can't do remote work for, for out of state, right? If you don't have a New Hampshire license, you can't work claims out of that state. So the more licenses you have, the better. So two things to summarize that I would say, um, concentrate on building relationships by bringing value to the table with your your attitude and your posture as like, I'm here to serve the industry. And second, get absolutely as many licenses as possible. If people are like, you know, I don't think anybody's going to comment on this, but I know I see on social media, well, I'm not getting licenses until they got work in that state and then I'll, I can get the license real quick or whatever. The problem with that is, is that when they call the adjusters to go work in the state, they don't just call everybody and say, hey, you want to go work in New Hampshire? They go to their 
roster and they just sort by the has the state license or not column, right? So they say, does this person have a New Hampshire license? And they get 15 people that have a New Hampshire license. They're calling those people, right? They're not calling the guy with one license or, or you know, no licenses. He's, he's just waiting, right? You don't want to be that person. Um, so lead with value, posture yourself as a servant to the industry, get licenses and get training. If you're a brand new adjuster working for a major IA firm, you will most likely already be covered under a blanket errors and emissions policy. You probably already pay something like five or $10 per claim for this coverage. And what is errors and emissions? Well, if you're accused of messing something up on a claim, your E and O insurance will step in and help you out. But what if you cause damage or injury on a field inspection? For example, your ladder falls down and smashes the insured's brand new Ford F-150 Lightning. Then a general liability policy will cover you in that instance. Again, you likely have a little bit of protection through your IA firm as a newbie adjuster. However, if you've got a year or two under your belt and you make most or all of your annual income from claims work, then you owe it to yourself to upgrade your E&O and general liability coverages to be customized to you. And depending on how many claims you run in a year, there's a very good chance these policies will be cheaper for you with your own coverages. Better and cheaper? Sign me up. There's only one company that provides E&O and general liability solely to the insurance industry, and that is CPLIC, aka Kaplik. They even have drone and cyber coverages. Download the free guide all about the different kinds of insurance you as the adjuster should carry at cplic.net slash adjuster TV. And with more than 700 videos, there's plenty more to watch here on adjuster TV. Don't know where to start? Just go to my videos page here on YouTube and type in a search term right here to find an answer to almost any question you have about property claims handling. And we'll see you in the next one.